Parents who feel annoyed or angry at kids who have needs can do a lot of damage. And if this happened to you growing up, you might find yourself today surrounded by people who you can't have needs around. And you listen to them and support them, but when it's their turn to do that for you, you're magically not there. And they either don't care when you're having a hard time or they literally can't tolerate it. It's not reciprocal. And you might think that all people are like that, but they're really not. It's that whether you know it or not, you're picking people who are like that and you're participating in that dynamic with them without even knowing it, probably because you have a blind spot. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Jean and she writes, Dear Anna, I have recently subscribed to your channel and have been watching one of your videos where you describe abandonment melange. I'm definitely experiencing this feeling right now after something which happened to me yesterday. Abandonment melange is a phenomenon named by Pete Walker that people who are abandoned as kids sometimes get that uh, feels like a very intense mix of rage, grief, and panic when you feel when your abandonment trigger gets set off. And it's more intense maybe than non-traumatized people and you kind of know it. Maybe if you get it, you know what I'm talking about and you've kind of known for a long time that you take it harder than other people when somebody leaves you or even when you fear they're gonna leave you. Actually, you can get abandonment melange just from thinking that you wanna leave. So that's what this is about. All right, so Jean says, I know the feeling is probably too intense for what the situation warrants, but I feel lost and confused because every time I feel I've established a solid connection or friendship with someone, it seems to blow up and evaporate the moment I express having any struggles, problems, or needs of my own. I've got my fairy pencil here. I'm going to circle things I want to come back to. I'm going to read through Jean's letter so we can just hear what the story is here, and then I'll go back and talk about things I circled. All right, I've been happily married, she says, for the past 15 years. Before meeting my husband, all my romantic relationships were either short-lived or, quote, casual. I'm guilty of having been the cool girl in my friendships, too, always having a tendency to put the needs of my friends before my own, then being punished or abandoned by these people when I dared to express any issues of my own. As a result, I tended not to suppress this side of myself and just basically crap-fitted, telling myself this was the price I had to pay to have friends and to be accepted in a social setting. Crap-fitting, that's a word that I made up for when we fit ourselves to crap. We, we get very good at it as kids to just, you know, whatever, however unacceptably we're being treated or the situation's bad, we fit ourselves to it. You can pass, you can lose a lot of years of your life crap fitting instead of having something that's happy for you. Okay. So Jean goes on. I grew up with parents who were emotionally immature and would often tell me that I was too much. Have you been told that? I really resonated with that, Jean. Instead of instilling discipline or setting boundaries appropriate to raising children, they would verbally lash out at me whenever I crossed the line. Fast forward to the present. Nearly a year ago, my husband developed a sudden, rapidly developing illness, and we decided to move cities to get better access to medical treatment. Shortly before this, I met a good-looking gay guy at my gym who seemed incredibly cool and funny, but also open to discussing his vulnerabilities. We hung out a couple of times and talked about a lot of things, and I felt like I had found that special connection. He expressed dismay that I was moving away. However, we kept in touch, mostly through messaging. The communication gradually dropped off as the months went on, but I just put this down to having separate and busy lives. Yesterday, this guy posted a meme on social media about dealing with personal struggles, and it resonated with me so much that I messaged him to tell him this. He replied that he's going through some heavy stuff at the moment and lamented the general lack of support from people around him. I told him I will be in town next week for work, and he replied that he would love to catch up with me, and then I did it. I sent two further messages briefly telling him about the struggles around my husband's illness, the treatment, and people's lack of understanding about the condition, kind of reflecting the sentiment that he had expressed. 
He stopped replying and left these messages unread. Following the advice of my late grandmother, I never write anything to anybody that I would not feel comfortable seeing printed in the newspaper. Hence, I'm confident I didn't write anything bad or crazy to this guy. Nonetheless, I feel embarrassed and downright crushed by the cessation of communication. Truthfully, I was so distraught yesterday I had to take medication. This kind of thing happens to me so much, and I cannot understand why. People who are all over me one moment ghost me in the moment I basically tell them my life is not perfect. I become highly triggered, um, especially when I express vulnerability to someone and it's not acknowledged. Recently, I opened up to my mother about overcoming my mental health struggles. She immediately responded by asking, had I heard from my sister? A further reaffirmation, says Jean, from my childhood, that I'm just not important enough to care about. Only after yesterday's episode did it hit me that this guy, who I had thought of as a friend, never once asked me about my husband's condition the whole time I've moved away, despite being aware of the situation. We chatted and messaged about other stuff, but it was always very lighthearted and harmless, like movies and music or his problems at work. Just realized he never asked me about my work either. I saw a therapist a couple years back who picked up on my hiding my own needs and problems so as not to appear off-putting to others. She made me realize that a healthy friendship entails a two-way exchange where both parties are allowed to have less than perfect lives. My question to you is, how do I go about cultivating healthy friendship dynamics where this kind of exchange is welcome and support is given as well as received? I'm scared that if anything happens to my husband, my life is going to be horrible if I keep attracting these types of friendship dynamics. Many thanks. All right, Jean, I think I can help you. Um, so let's go through what you told me. So you, you get abandonment, Melange. You feel abandoned by the, uh, this frequent, exp or I don't know how frequent it is, but it's happened again and again, where you have a friend and they just ghost you. And it always seems to happen when you express having any struggles, problems, or needs of your own. I know what you're talking about. I do know people where I've had that dynamic with, and it used to puzzle me too. Um, you say, I've been happily married for the past 15 years. Before meeting my husband, relationships were short-lived or casual. So I don't know what it means that you had that kind of relationship, whether it was youth or um, a, another manifestation of this type of person who you end up being friends with, but you have a happy marriage now. So let's just call those past relationships water under the bridge. And you used to be the cool girl and you do it with friends too. Cool girl is, she's like, hey, I'm cool. I don't need anything. And it's usually used in a context of a sexual relationship where the, the man doesn't want anything serious, just wants sex whenever he wants it. And cool girl is like, that's cool. That's cool but might be just dying inside thinking she has to act cool. So we're not into being cool girl here. Tendency to put the needs of your friends before, before your own. And then you get quote, you say punished or abandoned when you dare to express any issues of your own. So you keep having that experience. It's funny how whatever's in here will just keep being your experience out there. Right? So your parents were emotionally immature. That's an interesting choice of words and would often tell you that you were too much. Oh my gosh, I have been told I'm too much too. And I'm just the right amount. I just wasn't in the right place in my life yet. For me to stand here right now in my studio, making a video, talking to nobody but a camera, you have to be kind of big. <laughs> you have to have a lot of, you know, going on here. And so this part of my personality, when I'm at the dinner table or meeting somebody new, I have to turn it way down because it's totally bowls people over. It's too much. So context, context, right? But, but you know, we, we have a personality that we were born with and all of our healing is about becoming our real selves, learning where our, our mistakes, our tendency to make mistakes, where that needs to be adjusted so that us being fully ourselves is also kind and considerate and reciprocal and all that good stuff. So you're on the way here. They wouldn't set boundaries or set discipline. They would just lash out. So it's, this is interesting too. You kind of see that where you don't realize that you're crossing some line with friends. It's just, except you say something and then they're out and you're confused about that. You know, they just stop calling you somehow you were too much. So that's definitely the theme you're communicating to me. You know, you, you're baffled. Why do I seem like too much? I was so careful to contain my personality. All right. So fast forward to the present. 
um, your husband's having a serious health thing. Wow, that must be incredibly hard. Of course you need friends. And then you move to this other city to get the better medical treatment and now you're alone. And you try to maintain a friendship by chatting with the gay guy at the gym. And he was funny and cool. And he talked about his, his vulnerabilities. Okay, so there, there are his virtues. He's funny, he's cool. He talks about his vulnerabilities. What he doesn't seem to be good at is caring about you even enough to ask how your husband is doing. I, I know such people. There are many of them. Not, not most people are like that. But, you know, it's self-centered. It's also emotionally immature. Um, and some people, it's enough that they are fun friends that you hang out and do something fun and you don't talk about your problems. Like that can be a perfectly fine kind of relationship to have, but you're going to the hardware store for milk here. You're going to this person who really he says right out, I'm going through heavy stuff. I can't care about you right now. And then he doesn't call you if you say that you're having a heavy thing and you are having a heavy thing and somebody has to be mature in a good place and receptive to being supportive of somebody who's going through something like that because it kind of outdoes whatever he's going through I don't know but yours is pretty big and so maybe he's an, a narcissistic type where his problems always have to be the biggest or maybe he's just in it going through heavy stuff right now and he can't deal with somebody whose partner is very sick and who's having crisis you know it's okay that he feels that way but it's not the friend that you need and are looking for. That's all. So we can just, you know, we can like take off any like villainizing of him or these other friends. They're not villains. They're just not the right one. And so you stayed in touch and you're blaming yourself. You're like, and then I did it. I sent two text messages telling him about struggles around your husband's illness because, and I'm going to say this is probably your CPTSD. If you didn't have the trauma when you were a kid and you had been totally emotionally raised by good, sane parents, you would be able to read the room and, you know, you'd be able to tell, like, you would have noticed a long time ago that he sort of fades out when you talk about yourself. He doesn't want to talk about you. He wants to talk about him. He's happy to have you around. If you talk about him, he doesn't want to carry any water for you. That's all. Um, I mean, I don't think it's great, but I, I do like to emphasize that blaming other people is not really productive. So, you know, the, all the focus is like, okay, what can you do? What have you done? What can you do? Because that's where your power to change the situation is. So you told him about what you're going through and it was very similar to what he had said. And then he just stopped even accepting your messages. I try, I, I believe you, you didn't say anything bad or crazy. Some relationships are the kind where you can talk about this stuff. Um, I've talked in some of my earlier videos. I had a period between 2004 and 2008 when I was in and out of the hospital for 14 surgeries. I was a single mom. The whole situation was throwing my life into chaos, financially, emotionally, socially. And it was shocking how few of my friends would actually show up and help me. You know, there were a few people who came to the hospital once, but mind you, I was there 14 times for probably a cumulative four months or something. So, you know, a few one-time visits were not enough. And I, I had whole weeks without visitors. And I was surprised because I used to give a lot more energy than that to other people. And some of the ones, like I was a 12 step sponsor and, um, yeah, they, <laughs> that's a lot of, it's a lot of time that you share with another person. It's not an, it's not a commodity exchange. You know, you're not giving time and in, in, in demand for something back, but I was just disappointed. I was like sponsoring 12 people and only a few of them ever showed up to, you know, help me out. I needed housework. I needed my kids driven around. I needed food. Sometimes I was doing better, but when I was first out of the hospital or needed a ride home, it, I just was like a pile of needs and I had such a hard time asking for it because I guess I knew on some level that they were going to let me down. And then a few people show up and not only do they not let you down, but they amaze you. And so I think sometimes when we're suffering and like what you're going through and what I'm going through, one silver lining is that it forces you to have to reach out for help. And if you're like me, like you don't do that very much. And so you don't have the fruit of finding the people who are actually there for you. And so there, it's never enough though. <laughs> um, I have this documented in some of my other videos and courses, but you know, I just, there were times when I just didn't have anybody and I was in such grief about it. I, I, I couldn't get better from all this surgery. It kept falling apart because I couldn't rest and I was lifting my little kids and, and I, I was so sad and I was like, why is my life so hard? And other people aren't. And uh, a mentor said to me, 
because you don't have a mom, you don't have a sister, you don't have a best friend, and you don't have a, a partner. And I was like, ah, <laughs> there's the math, right? So your husband's in need right now. You don't have enough support um, for dealing with that. So that's an important problem for you to tend to, but you need the right people. You need the right people, and sometimes it takes time to cultivate those relationships. But it can feel less like despair when you're on the path, when you're working on cultivating those relationships. And by writing this letter and sort of inviting some insight about it, you are taking a huge step toward opening your mind and your healing process. So you're good. You're, things are going to happen. Things are going to happen because you've done that. So you said, I get highly triggered when I exp express vulnerability to someone and it's not acknowledged. So one thing about that, just to see, can we scan the horizon for anything you might be doing to make it worse? When we have a trigger, um, it's understandable that you have a trigger about that, but it could be kind of uncomfortable for people. Your energy gets weird. There's anger where it's kind of puzzling to people. So that might be something is that when you express vulnerability or say something, you might already have a little bit of tone that's kind of putting people on notice, just possibly. I'm not accusing you, just like ask yourself, is that it? And you might not be able to stop doing that right now because you still have a trigger, but that's what my program is all about. You learn to calm these triggers and then they come out just neutral and they don't have that charge that feels like an accusation. Because two people, they have a nervous system, you have a nervous system. And no matter, no matter how much you're acting like the cool girl and being like, no, it's fine that I pay attention to all your problems and needs and you run away. That's no, it's cool right? <laughs> if you do that. But your energy can't lie. They can feel you. <laughs> they can feel you and they can feel that you're angry and that you are, you need something from them. And sometimes being that you didn't get your needs met as a kid, that need can be a little outsized. So again, I don't know if that's true for you, but it's something to ask yourself. It's, it's a way that people with CPTSD can kind of be part of this dance of getting treated this way, okay? Recently, you opened up to your mother about overcoming your mental health struggles. Okay, I understand the impulse, but I just wanna say, you get, <laughs> you get what you pay for, right? If your mom is the person who treated you that way, chances are high she cannot hear this. And that's just been a lot of our experience. She can't hear it. Um, but you tried. It's worth a try. It's worth a try, but if I had been there at your side while you did that, I would have said, prepare yourself. It's probably not going to go well. And if it doesn't, just don't even worry. You're, all you're doing is running an experiment. Like, is today a day when she can maybe hear it? Ah, no, still no. Okay, cool. <laughs> you don't have to be cool, girl, but you just have to be realistic sometimes. Like, mothers are supposed to care, but she can't. And it's sad but she can't. So again, it's going to the hardware store for milk. Um, so, but this was interesting what you said. She, when you, when you said, hey, I overcame my mental health struggles, she immediately started asking if you had heard from your sister. She dodged that one. <laughs> Hearing about your mental health, that you ever had mental health struggles probably reminds her, at least on an unconscious level, that she didn't treat you well as a kid. And it's not surprising that you would have struggles. Oh, hey, change the subject. How's your sister? So that doesn't surprise me, but I know what it's like. And it's just like such a colossal and obvious dodge of, of you opening your heart. And I'm sorry, you know, that does feel bad, but it's time to adjust your expectations. You have such a mother. Um, and so here's what's interesting. You said she did that and you put in bold face a further reaffirmation from my childhood that I am just not important enough to care about. All right, I'm going to stop you right there. No, that's not what it is. I think you're telling me what your fear is, you know, fear, it just goes to show I'm not important. And I hear that that's how your emotional being hears it. But no, it's a reaffirmation that she is emotionally damaged and not able to pay attention to another person's needs and needed to change the subject either, either on purpose or unconsciously, or basically is just so freaking out of it that she doesn't even know that you don't, you're not supposed to do that, that that's rude. Yeah, you have, you have a mother who's incompetent at uh, hearing sensitive things and responding appropriately. In the end, that's what it is. So it reaffirms nothing about you. It says nothing about you. There's nothing wrong with you for having this wound from how you were treated. That's, a, that, that's to be expected. It's normal. And you're actually, you know, you're working on it. So you're fine. There's no reaffirmation that you're not important enough to care about. You're totally important and you need to be cared about. You have a husband now, so 
You're, you know, that's somebody who cares about you. Your mom probably is never going to care for you more than she does right now. And it'll, you know, it'll be superficial. She can't hear you. Um, I don't know anything about her, but I just know she couldn't respond to you in that moment. And it was really, sounds like it's, it's never really better than that. So you, a therapist validated for you. Yeah, this is a, you, you hide your own needs and problems to not be off putting. So you really seem to have internalized this idea that you're too much. And if you did, you're so much like me and so many women that I'm close to where we're just like, yes, we're too much. And what is too much? We're very vibrant emotionally, often uh, intellectually. We have a lot to say, like, you know, I'm not always received well when I have opinions or when I have um, a lot of exuberance or enthusiasm. It feels like a lot to people. I'm at a point where my emotional needs are basically met by me and I have a husband and I have sons who are caring, you know, I'm reasonably cared for enough that any, anybody else, if they're uncaring towards me, it doesn't destroy me. I think it's rude. I might not like them. It hurts my feelings, but it doesn't destroy me anymore. I have a defense there. And I know a lot of people are listening and they just don't have that person who gives them a little buffer, who cares about them even when other people don't. And so all of us, that's our job is to learn to connect enough to have people who do care. Um, and should we need help, they will be there for us. And part of how we do that is by being there for them. And it's a tricky dance, isn't it? Because you don't want to be a doormat. You've been sitting there listening to like this, this gym guy's problems all this time. So here's another thing just to ask yourself. I don't know that this is what you did, but this is one thing that a person sometimes does, which is when you tend to take care of other people's needs and they don't reciprocate, it can be this kind of negative toxic pattern of trying to do a trade with them that they never consented to. You're just like, hey, I'm cool girl, I'm your friend, we're just friends. Um, oh, that's so sad that you have that problem and then you, you demonstrate all this empathy for them. But on some level, you're trying to make a trade with them. Like, I, I tell you what, I'll go over the top and care for you. Will you do it for me? But it's not spoken. And it's, you only hung out with them a couple times. So, you know, it's like, this is a little bit like dating, like two dates. You don't really get to have big expectations of somebody. All that is, is a way to get to know somebody. And some people do like open up intimacy, friendship, closeness with others by talking about their problems. Right? So this guy did that, but that was, yeah, it just wasn't what you hoped. So I would say women, friends, you know, people who have some similarity to you, like it's okay to have a, a, a male friend and a gay male friend is safe for your marriage and everything. But, but women, um, it's really important to be friends with women, especially when you had a crap mom. And I speak from experience. I had a long time when it was hard for me to do that. And it's so much better now. And there's an important thing that, you know, people who are similar, they can give each other, you know, they can have that understanding together. Um, so that said, everybody's got to find friendship where they can. Everybody's a little unique. Not everybody fits the mold. You know, I used to think it was, ah, I'm just, not, I'm just not like woman-like and I fit in better with guys. But I think a lot of that was, it was CPTSD. It was CPTSD making it very triggering for me to be around women and especially the way they have ease around each other. It's hard. Then I'm like, why do they have ease? I don't know what to say. I don't know the right thing to say. And the less fear and resentment I have, I, you know, I use this technique, the daily practice. I teach it in a free course. It's always down below in the description section. It's on my website, Crappy Childhood Fairy, free course. You take that free course and I will send an email to you inviting you with a welcome. You get a welcome email and it says, do you want to join me in my free calls? And I do the calls twice a month and people come on live and ask me questions. We use the techniques and then I take questions. But using that technique, the reason I devote so much time to sharing that with the world is because it saved my life and it helped me just move a lot of like just fearful, resentful thoughts. I don't know where they go. I don't know how they connect. I don't know what causes what. I don't have to know. I just have to get them on paper and out, ask for them to be removed, rest in meditation. And I just find 
that my mind has room for new things, new development, new feelings, new relationships. I'm not so in the grip of things that have hurt me in the past. And you know how they do that. They're just sort of like right on top of your head, <laughs> you know, and squish you down. And it's all you can, you know, it just, it attracts your focus. And every time your feelings get hurt, you're like, see that thing, that thing. And I hear that going on for you. It's normal. But the more you get free of that, the more you can begin to have a new experience. And isn't that what we all want? We want newness. We want the opportunity to have a life defined by who we really are and not by what they did to us. So what do we do about this? So how can you change the pattern? Jean, this is what I want to suggest to you. Think of these friendships a little like dating, where you're not going to just rush in and be best friends and tell each other your problems. Your problems are not the main thing about you, even though right now it is kind of the main thing about you that you're going through this crisis with your husband. But you are a whole person with a whole life and a whole story and a whole set of ears and a whole heart to share. And so gradually, I'm going to say like six times hang out with somebody before you get into problems of your own, right? Just six times to hang out, hang out, have light conversations, ask questions, tell things about yourself, but not the heavy stuff yet. All right. That's, that's the secret is just to allow a friendship to sort of take root, get a feel for it. Sometimes you hang out three times and you just realize, eh, we don't have anything in common. Or you hang out for a few times and you're just like, I don't like this person. I don't like what they just did, how they treated the waiter or whatever it was. And so you're going just a little at a, at a time. Think of it like an egg carton, put one egg in at a time, you know, one egg in at a time. You don't just take the whole thing and go. So just gradually test the relationship and see, and you can begin to introduce things that are on your mind, not crises yet, but just kind of be very conscious and just see how they respond to that. And don't go in and caretake them emotionally around the problems they say. You know, you can nod. Honestly, when I talk about my problems, I find it very hard when people get in there and try to fix it for me and go, oh my God, that's so hard. Because what you're saying is, and they try to reframe it. And I know they're just being kind, but I don't like having my stuff reframed. Mostly I like, if I, if I tell a friend I'm having a hard time with this, I, 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 I cut my teeth emotionally in Al-Anon years, you know, and there's a custom there that you just let people say what they're saying. You don't comment on it. You don't go pat them on the back or anything. You just let people say what they're saying, even when they're sad. After the meeting, you can go up and go, oh, I heard what you said. And that sounds really hard. And here's my number. You can do that, but you don't do it in the middle of people talking. And at first it felt very weird to me, but you actually can just let people talk and give them your full attention and show them with your face that, that you care. You don't have to rush in and fix it. And definitely you want to stay away from trying to create any sort of tit for tat. Like I tell you what, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of like empathy, but you owe me <laughs> really just get to know somebody and see if, see what they're like and see if they really are somebody that you want to share things with or that you want to give a whole bunch of emotional energy to. Now, because you have this kind of like trauma imprint where, and, and I think you had said, you know, that you attract this kind of person. Did you say that? I don't know. You may not have, but that's often our perception. We just go, I don't know where these people find me, but they do. They're actually, um, there's a whole mix of people around you, just like everybody. It's not magic. It's who you resonate with. You know, you're used to it from your mom. You have the capacity to pay attention to people who are self-centered. And they love that, believe me, because they're so self-centered, like they can't get everybody to do that. So when they find somebody like you, they're not being devious. They're not intentionally hurting you, but they're just like, they love to have people dote on their problems and they're not interested in giving it back. That's, that's how they roll. You will crap fit to that. So there you are. Now you have a friendship with a person like that. Somebody who didn't have your trauma would probably just like be like, oh, you know, hi, gym guy, and then not have a friendship because they would sense the shallowness of somebody who talks about themselves, but shows no curiosity and does not even respond when you say, well, I'm moving away because my husband has a serious medical thing. Like any, any friend who is emotionally intact is going to go, oh my gosh, what's going on? Is he going to be okay? Where are you going to live? You know, like any friends would do that. The guy at the gym, you'd only hung out a couple times. So it's not even really on him to be that he hasn't let you down. He's just revealing who he is and what he's interested in right now. And it's not what you hoped. So he's off the hook. You're off the hook. And now you get to practice through getting to know people in your new city by, you know, one little hangout at a time, one conversation at a time, 
Hold back on the heavy stories. If they're throwing heavy stories out there at you, you can say things affirmative like, oh yeah, that must be hard. I, I have experienced stuff like that. But don't, don't go into it yet. You're gonna, you're gonna be measured in your approach to sharing yourself and see what happens. Often by the time you've hung out six times, you're gonna have a feel for this kind of thing. You'll have a feel for whether they are a reciprocal person. You can absolutely shift your pattern and change this, but it's just time to bring your awareness into it and just keep paying attention to the interactions. And for this, it helps if you, if, if the first ones are not super long, like don't, not a big day outing or something, a cup of coffee, a little walk, you know, a, a, a short thing so that you have a conversation. And it's okay that some friends are not our, for our deep stuff. They're just people we take walks with. That's okay. You can do that. I think you're going to do well though. I think you're going to recover because where your attention is right now is right where it needs to be to start opening your mind. I like what you're doing. If you love this topic, I've got a video lined up for you and it's called, if you're struggling to connect with real friends, you're probably doing this. It's about having no more broken friendships. And that video is right here. And I will see you very soon.